Okay, guys, welcome back. This is the official beginning of Unit 6 on Gene Expression and Regulation. This is our new unit now that we have taken the Genetics Unit Test. And uh, this is looking at genes from a molecular viewpoint. How do genes work at the molecular level? Today we're going to cover the pages that you should have read over the weekend, which was pages 253 to 256 in our Campbell Biology in Focus textbook. And specifically today we're going to talk about how scientists came to know that DNA, the DNA molecule, really is the molecule that carries our genetic information. And we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of genetics. Our good old friend Gregor Mendel published his findings in 1865. As you know, after nine years of painstaking pea plant crosses. And in 1865, when Mendel published the laws of heredity, the law of segregation of alleles, and the law of independent assortment, uh, nobody understood it. And it did not catch on, and he did not become famous. Uh, in fact, uh, it was about 35 years later, roughly 16 years after Mendel's death, that his work was finally rediscovered and began to capture the attention of the scientific community. So this was around 1900. It's kind of an interesting coincidence. Three different scientists in three different places in Europe uh, discovered copies of Gregor Mendel's original publication, his research findings from 35 years before. And these three individuals came across uh, this paper and they started uh, making people aware of it and the significance of it. And this was really the, the beginning of genetics as a branch, as a, a recognized branch of biological study. Uh, about two years after that, right around 1902, um, a theory began to emerge called the chromosome theory of inheritance. And this was the work of several different scientists. And you notice that um, one of those individuals is our friend Thomas Hunt Morgan, who we talked about uh, recently quite a bit. And as you know, Morgan uh, used Drosophila fruit flies for his research. And among many other things, Morgan is famous for being the first to be able to conclusively say that a particular gene the white eye mutation is definitely located on a particular chromosome. This was a brand new idea, the idea that Mendel's genes, Mendel's units of heredity were in fact physically located somehow on these newly discovered things called chromosomes. Only a couple years prior to this had chromosomes even been discovered. And so people were starting to put this together now that whatever genes are, they are somehow carried on chromosomes. So every gene has a specific locus, loci is the plural, a specific location on a chromosome. And this seems to be how genes are carried in all organisms. Well, in 1902 and the years that followed shortly after that, from a biochemical standpoint, what did we know about chromosomes? Well, we knew that chromosomes are chemically made up of two types of molecules, two chemical substances make up chromosomes, protein and DNA. So the logical conclusion was one of those two, either protein or DNA, must be the genetic molecule, must be the chemical that carries the genetic code. And up until the 1940s and even close to 1950, most scientists were convinced that it must be protein. DNA was thought to be too simple. DNA, after all, only has four chemical subunits adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, as you know. And so it's almost like you're talking about a, a genetic language that only has four letters in its alphabet. That seemed way too simple to carry the entire instruction book for a living organism and certainly way too simple to carry the instructions for a human being. So people thought, well, it's got to be protein. Protein must be 
the genetic molecule. Well, one of the experimental uh, results that started to shift the thinking in a different direction started uh, people down the road towards accepting that DNA might be the genetic molecule was some work that was done by Dr. Fred Griffith uh, in the 1920s. And uh, Griffith worked with a type of bacteria called Streptococcus pneumoniae. Streptococcus uh, is a common genus of bacteria. Um, Streptococcus pneumoniae is, as you would expect, a bacteria that can cause pneumonia, a very deadly form of pneumonia. Well, Griffith figured out that there are, in fact, two different strains of Streptococcus pneumoniae. There are S cells, uh, which are smooth on the outside surface and extremely deadly. And he discovered this by injecting S cells into living mice and they were not living for long because they developed pneumonia and died very quickly within a few days. So this was kind of the first part of the experiment. Now Griffith also recognized that there are uh, R cells. There's a different strain of this bacteria called R cells and they are rough on their outside edge and they are not deadly. So if you inject R cells, living R cell bacteria into the mice, uh, they might get some little mild symptoms, respiratory symptoms, but they, they do not die. None of them died in that particular group. R cells are not deadly. So then what he did was he took some of the living S cells. Remember, these are the deadly bacteria. And he took those living S cells and he boiled them. He heat killed them. Now, if you boil bacteria, of course, that kills the bacteria. So these are deadly S cells, but they've been killed. And when you inject those heat killed S cells into the mice, you'll notice the mice survive. Which is so, so far, no, nothing's a surprise, right? Uh, because uh, living S cells are deadly, living R cells are not deadly. And even the deadly S cells, if you boil them, are no longer deadly. Here's where it gets interesting. The last experimental group of mice were injected with a mixture. Now look at this carefully. Look, look what's in this syringe right here. He injected these mice with living R cells, which are not deadly, and heat killed S cells which are not deadly, and yet the mice died. Now, that's a surprise, at least initially he was surprised by that. But what's an even bigger surprise is when those mice died, he then took a blood sample from those dead mice, and what he found in their blood was living S cells the living deadly bacteria and the question was where did they come from he did not inject living s cells into these mice so where did those living s cells come from and the answer turned out to be that the living r cells somehow picked up a gene from the boiled dead s cells so once they picked up that gene, it changed them. They changed. They were transformed from R cells into S cells because they picked up a gene from the dead S cells. And so this was the first realization by any scientist that one strain of bacteria can pick up, can acquire genetic information from other cells and that once that new gene is brought in, it'll, it can actually change one strain of bacteria into a different strain. So here's kind of a summary. This is 1928. The scientist is Fred Griffith. And you can see some of the details that I mentioned earlier. By the way, uh, virulent is just a fancy term for uh, deadly. Non-virulent means non-deadly. Um, and so what did Griffith conclude that um, that 
genetic material can transform R cells into S cells. It was the discovery of bacterial transformation. That's what we call that phenomenon. And there was one big unanswered question at the end of Griffith's ex experiment. What is that transforming factor? Is it DNA or is it protein that was leaking out of those S cells and transforming those R cells? Well, Griffith didn't know. He had no way of knowing, but uh, he hypothesized that it was DNA. So a few years later, in 1944, uh, Avery and McCarty and McLeod, uh, a, a three-person research team, uh, were, they were able to prove that Griffith's transforming factor really is DNA. It is not protein. That DNA has the power to transform R cells into S cells. And there's not a lot of detail that I'm providing here, but basically what they did is they took a bunch of boiled S cells and they treated them with chemicals that would either break down all of their proteins or break down their DNA, but not, but not both at the same time. And if they if they broke down the DNA, then those dead cells were not able to transform living R cells. But if they broke down the protein part and left the DNA intact, then the R cells would be transformed. Um, so anyway, I know that's a little confusing, but, but, but basically they were able to prove, this is what you need to know about Avery, McCarty, and McLeod. They were able to prove that Griffith's transforming factor really is DNA. It is not protein. The next big piece of evidence, uh, this one's also kind of complicated, but it's a really beautiful, elegant, creative experiment. Um, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase were a research team who did not like each other very much, but worked well together and were able to do some wonderful research. But they, they were probably, they probably deserve credit for finally proving once and for all that DNA is the genetic molecule and no, it is not protein. And they did this using a type of virus. Viruses have certainly been in the news a lot lately. They used a virus called T2 bacteriophage and I'll show you what this looks like in a minute, but a bacteriophage is a virus that can only infect bacteria. So it's kind of interesting. It's a virus that does not make humans sick. It does not make plants sick. It only attacks bacteria. And it does like all viruses, it injects its own virus genetic information into a host cell, which in this case is an E. coli bacteria cell, and it forces that host cell to become a virus-making factory. Now, um, one reason why Hershey and Chase chose bacteriophage viruses, or phage as they're called uh, sometimes, uh, is because of the simplicity. So if you look at a phage virus, um, it has two parts and only two parts. It has a little bit of nucleic acid, which in this case is DNA. Some viruses have RNA, but this one has DNA. And then um, the outside of the virus is surrounded by a jacket or a coating of protein. And that includes these weird little landing gear, these little feet that look like they're the landing gear of a spacecraft. Those are part of the protein coat. And the purpose of those little feet is to sort of attach to a host cell. So I'm, I'm drawing a big bacteria cell. This is supposed to be a bacteria cell. And the virus basically attaches to the outer surface of the bacteria. The genetic material gets injected into the host cell and it takes over the host cell and it forces it to make new viruses. Now remember, Hershey and Chase were trying to figure out which part of this virus? Is it the DNA part or is it the protein part? 
which part of the virus is the genetic molecule. Now you look at this picture and you say, well, it's obviously the DNA. That's what's being injected. Obviously the virus is injecting DNA into the host cell bacteria. But see, they didn't know that. They couldn't see that happening. They probably suspected that was the case, but they wanted to prove that the DNA part of the virus really is the genetic molecule. So here's how they did that. So for many generations, for many, many days, Hershey and Chase would grow, and I'm using that term loosely here, but they would cultivate large quantities of this virus in these flasks. Um, and they basically had two separate batches of, um, two separate batches of viruses. Um, the um, batch one, those viruses were grown in a um, nutrient medium that contains S35, which is radioactive sulfur. Now, that's important because if you grow viruses in S35, only the protein coating of the virus will become radioactive. And we're not talking about nuclear weapon type radioactivity. We're not talking about gamma rays here. We're talking about low levels of radioactivity. The, the only reason you want to do that is that you can track where that part of the virus ends up. Um, because you can't see this happening. Viruses even today are really too small to, you can, you can see them with an electron microscope, but in the 1950s, really, the technology was, would not allow us to see what these viruses were doing. So these scientists, Hershey and Chase, had to figure out a way to track what's happening to the protein coat and what's happening to the DNA, because they wanted to figure out which one of those molecules, the DNA or the protein, is the genetic molecule. So again, batch one, if you grow the viruses in S35, then only the protein part of the virus becomes radioactive. But if you grow um, the virus in, I'm trying to change colors here, bear with me. Uh, if you grow the viruses in Oh, good. In P32, which is radioactive phosphorus, then the DNA part of the virus will be radioactive, and only the DNA part will be radioactive. So you got two different batches of viruses. Into each flask was added some bacteria. So you see these the, the little ovals. Let me see if I can... I don't know if you can see where my cursor is pointing here, but these little oval shapes, those are the bacteria. E. coli, I think, is the bacteria they use. And if you add bacteria in with the viruses, you know what those viruses are going to do. They're going to land on the surface of the bacteria like little alien spacecraft. They're going to inject their genetic information into the host cell, and then that host cell is going to start making a whole bunch of viruses. And remember, I hate to keep repeating this, but it's important. What Hershey and Chase are trying to figure out is which part of the virus, the protein part or the DNA part, is actually being injected into the host cell. And they could not see this happening like you can see it in this picture. So anyway, they added the virus, they added, or they added the um, bacteria to the virus. They, they waited long enough for the viruses to attach and do their thing and in inject their genetic material into the host cell. And then they put the mixture into two separate blenders, one blender for each batch. And um, switch back to my original color here. Um, and the purpose of the blender is to agitate the cells so that the little parts of the virus that did not enter into the host cell will shake loose. So the only part of that virus that doesn't get shaken off is the part of the virus that's actually inside the host cell. And of course, you can see in this picture, it's the DNA part. But remember, they couldn't see it. They couldn't see that. So now that they've shaken off the outer part of the virus, 
they wanted to figure out, okay, which part of the virus is now located inside the bacteria? Because that's going to be the part of the virus that is the genetic molecule. So they dumped the liquid out of the blender into a test tube. They did this for both batches. They spun the test tube in a centrifuge, which is a machine that spins it around really, really, really fast. The bacteria cells are heavy and dense, and so they settled to the bottom and formed a solid pellet. And then the liquid part, which is right in this area, that's called the supernatant. And I'm not even going to begin to try to write that on the screen, but it's, it's a great big word. It just means the liquid part that does not settle to the bottom is going to have whatever little parts of the virus that did not get injected into the bacteria. And the part of the virus that did get injected into the bacteria is going to be down in that pellet um, because that's where the bacteria are. The last step was to take an instrument that measures radioactivity and they would scan to see which part of the test tube contained radioactive material. And now that I've scribbled all over this, it's hard uh, for you to see. I don't even know if I can easily erase all of this. Um, I'm wasting video time here, but let me see if I can quickly erase all ink. There we go. Clean that up just a little bit. Okay, so now you can see in the first batch, the only radioactivity they could find was in the supernatant, in the liquid part. And remember, the, the part of the virus that was radioactive was the protein part. So what does that mean? It means that the protein part of the virus did not get injected into the bacteria. All of the radioactivity stayed outside of the bacteria. So when a virus injects its genes into a host cell, it is not injecting protein. It must be injecting DNA. So let's see. Let me switch colors again. Oh, this would be so much easier if y'all were sitting right in front of me and I could just pick up whatever color pen I wanted to pick up. Um, so in the other batch, all of the radioactivity was in the pellet. That's significant because the pellet contains the bacteria plus whatever part of the virus was injected into that bacteria. And that was radioactive. Now, what part of the virus was radioactive in this batch? It was the DNA. Only the DNA was radioactive. Where did that radioactivity go? It went into the bacteria. So this is, a, this is big. This is proof that DNA is injected by a virus. Um, and so DNA must be the genetic molecule. Viruses don't use protein. They use DNA for their genetic material. So anyway, just to summarize, this was the final proof. Really, I think for most scientists, this really kind of, people were still skeptical after um, uh, Fred Griffith and Avery McCarty and McLeod. Um, people still thought, you know, DNA is too simple to be the genetic molecule. But the Hershey Chase experiment was finally the proof that convinced everybody, okay, it really must be DNA. And so now people began to focus on figuring out the structure of DNA. That's the part of the story that you already know about a little bit. Chargoff and Rosalind Franklin, the sad story of how her data was um, used inappropriately without her permission, and Watson and Crick. You're going to read a little bit about that tonight. Um, so I want to close. Uh, well, <laughs> I forgot this was in here. This is a great little animation of the Hershey Chase experiment. I'm going to see if I can post that either in the comments on YouTube or maybe I'll just post it on Google Classroom. But if I can get it to work, it's a really good little animation that might help you understand it better. But I want to close with um, this. In addition to all these experiments that we discussed today, 
there is just some good old fashioned circumstantial evidence, common sense evidence that suggests that DNA really is the genetic molecule. For example, right before cells divide by mitosis, right before prophase begins, during the S phase, all of the DNA is copied. The amount of DNA doubles inside the cell. Why does that happen? Well, because DNA is the genetic molecule. And before the cell splits, it has to make a copy of all of that information. And that really only makes sense if it is carrying the genetic information. During mitosis, DNA is distributed equally to the daughter cells. Again, that suggests there must be something really important about DNA. Um, and we know that diploid somatic cells have twice as much DNA as gametes. Diploid cells in humans have 46 chromosomes. Haploid gametes only have 23. All of that makes sense, really, only if DNA is the genetic molecule, which, of course, it is. So after 1952, based on this circumstantial evidence and based especially on the Hershey and Chase results, pretty much everybody in biology accepted that DNA is the genetic molecule. So the next reading assignment for you guys is pages 257 to 261. I hope this finds you well. Be safe, wash your hands, and I'll see you soon.